Welcome back to what is likely going to be the final episode in the series with Benjamin Graham's investing style, finding discounts and value in the markets. This episode is part three, which includes stocks plus the balance and income sheets. And this video took quite a while to make, so if you could like the video, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and hit the notifications, that would be greatly appreciated. Just like the other episodes, here is the organization table so that you can quickly find the topic that you're interested in, or if you have watched this previously and would like to come back to it, then you'll easily be able to pick up where you left off. To start off, I'd like to quote Benjamin Graham where he says, Broadly speaking, the price of common stocks is governed by the prospective earnings. These prospective earnings are, of course, a matter of estimate or foresight, and the action of the stock market on this point is usually controlled by the indicated trend. The price of the stock largely is based on other people's perceptions on how well they think the company will do in the future. It's good if they think that the market will get bigger or that the company will grab a larger portion of that market in the future, then the price will go upwards even if the earnings at the moment stay the same. And it's bad if the company misses earnings, faces increased competition, or makes a choice that investors feel will do poorly, then the price will swing downwards. So the company might say, check out this idea, and investors might think, wow, I think this will give the company a competitive advantage, and I'll pay more since they'll produce more earnings later. To illustrate the importance of future earnings, let's go into the perfect hammer company. What if there was a company that only sold one item, the perfect hammer? They spent all their time and energy into making this item, and they swore to never make anything else. And after creating the perfect hammer, all research and development funds went to zero dollars. We did it! It's flawless. Let's go on vacation forever. It never broke, it never got lost, because you can always look at its location online, and it always hits the nail on the head, and you never have to buy a new one ever again. So a new budget for management just came in. You all get shiny new hammers. And at the start, the PE could be extremely high. People all over the world want this perfect hammer. The value they obtain from this hammer is something that they can't pass up. Construction companies, contractors, dads building patios all over the world want this hammer and earnings come flying in. 1,000 hammers for my construction company. This is an expensive hammer, but it'll last. Incredible. This company will get so much business in such a short time. There's plenty of companies and people that want this. Then there would be a realization. It really was the perfect hammer. Everyone who initially bought the hammer no longer ever needed another hammer again. The earnings are steadily going up as more people are buying the hammers, but the PE keeps dropping on the stock. So yeah, I don't ever need to buy from this company again. They won't be getting my business anymore. Oh no, I have to sell this thing. Eventually, the company would die. The company kept their promise to only ever produce the perfect hammer. The market has become saturated and nobody needs to buy the company's hammer ever again. Earnings plummet in just a year and now people are desperate to get out of the business for good and are selling their shares like crazy. The moral of the story is that just because a company is doing well now or previously doesn't mean that the company is a good purchase. And he says that common stock selection is a difficult art. Naturally, since it offers large rewards for success, it requires a skillful balance between the facts of the past and the possibilities of the future. In theory, buying common stocks is simple. Your success will be in your ability to buy stocks when you are sure that the company will succeed more than what the current price is indicating. This company won't do well. Our analysts say so. I think it's going to do well and the price doesn't reflect that properly. In practice, buying common stocks is very difficult. How do you know how well a company will do in the future? When is a stock selling at a premium versus when it's selling at a discount? Oh, crystal ball, what will the next three years earnings be for this company? Maybe you should drink some water and sit down. You're talking to a crystal about company earnings. One of the best things that Graham suggested was taking industry averages and then comparing individual companies to the averages to see how well it is performing, and thus my work on industry averages. 
I take industry averages on spreadsheets and upload them into my Teachable account for people to see. Things like industry averages on various margins, book values, year-over-year -year growth revenues, average PEs, and so on. And I'll show you an example with a lot of electric companies in the next few slides. So here is the industry averages for the electric companies that I was looking at as of the 18th of July in 2019. So you can see the growth numbers up at the top, the margin numbers, the second from the top, price ratios, third from the top, and then down at the bottom, other numbers that I find interesting or important. So here are the electric companies that I was looking at and making the averages on. If there's a company that you're interested in, I would recommend looking at the number row that it's in and then following that along as I go through the slides. For example, if you want to follow Duke Energy Corporation, then follow along with 21 as we go through the slides. In this slide, we have the market cap, enterprise value, and total revenue of the electric companies that I was looking at at the time. Now we can get into the shares outstanding for all the companies I was looking at, the quarterly revenue growth year over year, and the quarterly earnings growth year over year. Next is the margins. We have the profit margins, the operating margins, the gross margins, the EBITDA margins, and then the quick ratio. Next, we have the current ratio, the trailing PE, the forward PE, the peg ratio, and the book value. Then we have ROE, ROA, percent held by institutions, and percent held by insiders. Lastly, there's the free cash flow, the operating cash flow, free cash flow divided by total revenue, operating free cash flow divided by total revenue, free cash flow divided by market value, and operating free cash flow divided by the market value. Then there's the price to book ratio and the percent cash holdings to the price. Businesses have to compete against each other and it's your job to see who's winning the race. The average for 25 steel companies for that year was slightly over 6%. That's him doing research on 25 different companies for just one percentage metric, before the days of the internet and computer-made spreadsheets. This can take some dedication and time to do. Looking at stocks is my hobby and passion. Stability that makes analysis easier. Earnings stable and gave substantial margin over dividend paid. Paid reasonable and healthy dividend. And book value close to market price. So which would you say is easier to predict and do analysis on? Company A earnings or Company B earnings? When things are sporadic, it's hard to tell where things are actually going and it might be speculative to put any money in that company at all. This is also where Graham gives his opinion on growth stocks. He feels that they are too speculative to be considered an investment and it's hard to accurately identify what the value is and pricing depends on what their revenue growth will be. And it's actually very difficult to determine what their revenue growth will be, thus making it speculative. I prefer to have consistent and adequate returns. There are three main criteria with picking stocks. Number one, he says to have a reasonably diversified portfolio in multiple industries. It's nothing too complicated. Pick what you consider to be good prospecting companies at good prices in multiple industries. And this was said in every single book that he wrote, which I read. Since Benjamin Graham prefers consistent and adequate returns over the long term, it makes sense that he is a huge believer in diversifying your picks. I'm so diversified, I have 30 different technology companies in my stock selection. You probably missed the part where it's important to be in multiple industries. The second is to use quantitative and qualitative factors to choose stocks. Although it's fun to think that there's some miracle formula that will spit out exactly what a company is worth, that's simply not true. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. How can I use this formula to pick stocks? What's Wall Street's secret formula? How do I explain this to him politely? Continuing on with the second criteria of using quantitative and qualitative factors, qualitative data will give a more likely opinion on future outlook. Would people continue to buy from this company in the future? 
why is this company better than other companies in the same industry? There seems to be a growing need for this market that I understand pretty well. Currently, there's only three companies that fulfill that need. I should look into the competitive advantages of each one to see which is best. Then we have the quantitative data, and that will tell you how their financial situation is doing. Can the company stay solvent during an economic downturn in the near future? What is this company's profit margin compared to other companies in the industry? The qualitatively best option doesn't seem to be financially stable. The qualitatively second best option seems to be in a very healthy state. I'll have to do some more comparisons. The third main criteria is to focus on how well you think the company will perform in the future, and this ties back to the second criteria with the qualitative data. It's very easy to get too focused on burying your nose in the sea of numbers getting thrown at you. You need to remember about a perfect hammer example. It doesn't matter what the past earnings and current earnings are for a company if they have no future. You're investing in companies because you want your money to grow with them. This company that only makes cassette players is the best. I'm thinking about investing in it. Dude, it's 2019. When you're doing your analysis, you'll find that evaluation is often a range, not a set number, because there are bull and bear scenarios for all the stocks you pick. You don't know what's going to happen far into the future. Does your company's plan actually work out, or did it flop? Since you don't know, Benjamin Graham says you need a range of evaluations because things can be good but just as easily, things could potentially be just as bad. The reason there's often a range is because it goes down to the growth ranges when you're evaluating the stocks. Assuming the bull case, what would be the best logically sound estimate for the company? And assuming the bear case, what would be the lowest logically sound estimate for the company? Then, it's a matter of how confident you are that the company will succeed. Will you lean towards the bull case growth number, or will it be the bear case growth number for your evaluations whenever you do your quantitative data analysis? Lastly, and possibly the most important for our general things topic, is the margin of safety. What is this generally for picking stocks? It is buying only when between 50 to 66% less than your intrinsic value calculation. So why is margin of safety important? It's because it gives great returns when you're spot on, because you paid less than what it's worth, but it also gives small returns or small losses when wrong. You didn't pay as much as what you thought you should have for the stock. I really thought that it was worth $100, but it's only gone to 75. Good thing I managed to get it for $50 instead of getting it earlier when it was more expensive. Think of it this way. Imagine building a bridge that needs to hold 100,000 pounds for multiple trucks to pass through. Would you really only make the bridge built to support, at best, 100,000 pounds? No, you'd go higher and be on the safe side so no issues would arise in the near future. We built the bridge to support a maximum of 100,000 pounds. My cargo plus truck alone weigh 100,000 pounds. So what's the issue? I weigh 180. Now we'll get into the defensive investor section of this video, where there's very simple selection policies and guidelines from Benjamin Graham. In the Intelligent Investor, which includes four core policies, seven selection guidelines. Some of the selection guidelines overlap and say the same thing as the core policies, but I'll cover them as they were presented in the book. I'll make some guidelines to help limit your selection pool so it's not so overwhelming. The first of our four core policies is adequate, not excessive, diversification. And I'm sure we've heard this 10 million times, but here's Benjamin Graham's take. What is adequate, but not excessive, according to Graham? That's between 10 to 30 different issues spread across multiple industries. 10 to 30 investments? That's it? Don't forget that Benjamin Graham, from part one of this series, recommended about half of your investments being put into bonds. Not to mention, keeping track of 30 companies is very difficult for the defensive investor. The second is to keep choices large and conservatively managed. So what does he mean by large? That means sticking to the top companies in well-developed industries and avoid the mid to low capitalization stocks. These can theoretically give you better returns, 
but will need to be looked at more consistently, which isn't in the defensive investor's style, for the safe and simple long-term choices. Pick a small cap high growth stock. One of these three will do well, the others not so much. Oh man, the pressure. Then we have what does conservatively managed mean? Ones that have their debt situation at a comfortable level. What makes their debt situation at a comfortable level? Well, if you haven't heard this enough, it's industry specific. A car company will be vastly different from a software company. The third of our core policies is to buy companies with amazing dividend histories of at least 20 plus years. Benjamin Graham is obsessed with dividends. He talks about them all the time in every single book that I've read. And he likely has a shirt that says, I heart dividends, similar to those I heart New York shirts. Yeah, that would make a great shirt. Our fourth core policy is to buy only at a reasonable price. And this one is simple in theory, but hard in practice. And as such, this is Benjamin Graham's advice for defensive investors. The investor should impose some limit on the price he will pay for an issue in relation to its average earnings over, say, the past seven years. We suggest that this limit be set at 25 times such average earnings and not more than 20 times those of the last 12-month period. Buy this company that has $100,000 in earnings for $5 million? Um, that seems kind of expensive. And just as a quick pause, if you would like to join Patreon, that would be greatly appreciated. Going into our seven selection guidelines for the defensive investor, the first is the adequate size of the company. And as mentioned previously, if you want to be defensive investor, then stick to the bigger companies with long and established histories. Going into number two is the strong financial condition. Companies that can handle their debts well are much safer than other choices. Number one, current assets should be at least twice the current liabilities. And two, long-term debt should not exceed the net current assets. Oh no, I'm not in a good spot. Next is stable earnings. See that your company is reliable with their earnings. 10 years where each year had increasing earnings. First year was five, second is eight, third is nine, fourth was four, but then year five comes and you get negative three earnings. But then the next year after that, it's 13% increase in earnings, followed by seven, two, five, and lastly, 9%. According to Benjamin Graham, this would be a failure because even though the loss was negligible only at 3% and then the recovery next year was up 13%, it still didn't have 10 consecutive years of increasing earnings. Fourth was strong dividend records. At least 20 years of payments going into the investor's pockets, preferably with dividends getting raised each year. For number five, we want continual earnings growth, a minimum increase of at least one third in per share earnings in the past 10 years. This is with using three year averages to calculate the beginning and end points. This way, you help reduce variance between the years. Slow and steady, right? Well, my company can go really slow. Too slow. Next. Number six is moderate price to earnings numbers. There's often a lot more assumed growth than real growth with high PE stocks. Sure, there are high PE stocks that can still give you great returns, but figuring out if the premium is worth it or not isn't something the defensive investor is good at doing. However, sometimes low PE stocks are indicative of 1. Poor financial condition, which likely won't be an issue if you're following the strict selection guidelines that Benjamin Graham is suggesting, and 2. Lacking future growth prospects, and this is where the qualitative nature of stock selection will come into play. It's possible that the company truly won't have good future earnings, but it's up to you as an investor to pick stocks that you believe in that will thrive into the future. I believe in you even if those other people don't. Thanks, Benjamin. I really needed that. They keep saying I'm too slow, but they don't understand my potential. Generically, Benjamin Graham sets the PE maximum of 15 for defensive investors. 
However, this number is somewhat flexible if you read the annotations in the Intelligent Investor, which I did and this is what it says. The stock portfolio, when acquired, should have an overall earnings to price ratio, the reverse of the PE ratio, at least as high as the current high grade bond rate. This would mean a PE no higher than 13.3 against a AA bond yield of 7.5%. And how are these numbers connected? You just take 100 divided by 7.5 which gives you the 13.3 that he is talking about. So for example, when the average 10 year AA rated bond in 2003 was 4.6%, that means a gram formula for this was the maximum of 21.7. Once again, 100 divided by 4.6 gives you 21.7. And as you can see, Graham's opinion of determining whether average PE numbers are moderate or not depends on what the average AA corporate rated bond yield is. Lastly, for our seven selection guidelines, we have the moderate price to assets ratio. And this is where the selection rules can shift around a little bit. For a moderate price to assets ratio, Benjamin Graham says that the current price should not be more than 1.5 times the book value. However, there was also the blended multiplier. Ultimately, the product of the PE times the price to book should not exceed the number 22.5. And that comes from what he said previously, which was 15 times the 1.5. So the PE can be higher than the maximum stated previously, or the PB can be higher than the maximum stated previously if, when you multiply them together, the number is at or less than 22.5. Now we get into the enterprising investor, and here are some special cases to make money as an enterprising investor. I'll go over four unique circumstances as described by Benjamin Graham. In the first two, he only puts money in if, 1. There's a calculated annual return of at least 20%, and B. The chance of a successful outcome was at least 4 out of 5. In the last two, he tried to find as many of these as he could. The first of the four special cases is arbitrage, second is liquidations, third is related hedges, and fourth was net current asset or bargain issues. Going into number one, arbitrages. This was one of Graham's favorite ways to make money. And one of the two arbitrages is pure arbitrage, buying differences in security costs across different exchanges. People like us likely won't ever be able to do this since there are super powerful computers that can look at this stuff constantly. But back in the day, he had more of an opportunity. So for example, we have one store that says buy our apples for 50 cents each. And we have another store that says we'll buy apples for 51 cents each. Wait a minute. The second of our arbitrages is risk arbitrage, and I'll provide the example of IBM's Red Hat acquisition. The announcement is that IBM was buying Red Hat for $190 per share, equating to about $34 billion. The acquisition possibility made Red Hat's price shoot up dramatically but you can't really know when these announcements will happen, so you have to make the choices after the fact. If you had confidence that it would go through to completion on the day of the announcement, here would be your returns. About 10.7% return in less than a year. Now, since this doesn't hit Graham's expected 20% minimum, he likely wouldn't have bought it even if he was 80% sure that it would have gone through to completion. The second was liquidations buying securities where the assets will be sold off and the cash obtained will be distributed. Going out of business, selling $10 million in assets. I'll have to look at their debt obligations and see if I can make money here. Third is related hedges, and the related hedge is buying and selling different securities from the same company. Benjamin Graham's purchasing time for this was where the position was established at close to a parity basis. He bought convertible preferred shares or bonds and sold the stock soon after converting. I like to exercise my investments. The fourth is the net current asset or bargain issues. Comparing the net current assets to the market valuation of the company. This is purely looking at cash and cash equivalents and not attributing to the other assets. Of course, he would be taking the debt obligations into account as well. 
And he says, our purchases were typically at two-thirds or less of such stripped-down asset value. In most years, we carried a wide diversification here, at least a hundred different companies. I'm selling this ugly bag that has $20 inside. I'll sell it for $15. What? Yes, I'll buy it. Now we can go into stock guidance for the enterprising investor. These are somewhat similar to the defensive investor guidelines, but less restrictive. If you're really an enterprising investor, then I'm assuming that you're doing more research on the well-being and future prospects of the company. The first is the financial condition part one. The current assets are at least 1.5 times the current liabilities. If current liabilities are $1 million, then the current assets must be at least, but preferably more, than $1.5 million. The second financial condition, part two, is that the debt must not be more than 110% net current assets with industrial companies. If net current assets are $1 million, then debt can't go past $1.1 million, but it's obviously preferably less. The third is earnings stability. No decrease in earnings for the most recent five years. 9% growth, 7% growth, 15% growth, 10% decline in year four, but then it rebounds 17% in year five. Even though it rebounds, it still declined in year four, so it makes it not a good choice according to Benjamin Graham. The fourth is the dividend record. Some current dividend. Yeah, even as an enterprising investor, I love dividends. Then we have the earnings growth. Minimum increase of at least one third in per share earnings in the past 10 years, using the three year averages to calculate the beginning and end points. I'm just a slow company. No snails here either. Now we can get into the price to earnings ratios for common stocks for the enterprising investor, where he says exact appraisals are not possible. Security analysis can't lay down a formula or set number to give the intrinsic value of any stock on the market. Valuations based on purely numeric formulas don't work according to Graham because there's too much variability in the earnings an individual company earns, not to mention industry differences. Thus, Ultimately, Benjamin Graham feels that the evaluations are a collection of human emotions with some basis of rough evaluation looking at the numbers being earned. Where he says, the stock market is a voting machine rather than a weighing machine. That's because in the short term, people are taking their votes with buying and selling. In the long term, the true value of the company will develop over time. Time shows everything. Mr. Market is just here to serve you the prices. What's the maximum limit he suggests for the price to earning ratios? At most, he says the PE ratio should only go as high as 20. Why? Because assuming that earnings stay the same and are treated as free cash flow to the shareholder, that would still be a 5% return. And this is treating it as if you truly did own the whole business when you're buying a stock. My small startup company I bought is only getting me 5% returns because I paid 20 times the earnings for it. Thank goodness I didn't pay more for it. And he says that the higher PE stocks are for speculative returns. He doesn't say it's a total mistake to invest with companies at high multiples. People can make money trading with these companies. However, people who habitually purchase common stocks at more than 20 times average earnings are likely to lose considerably more in the long run. Pick a good card and you'll have great returns. Pick a bad one and you'll lose more money in the long run. Not this card dealer again. I hate this guy. Of all the places to put this in the video, I felt this was the most appropriate for the enterprising investor. It is the Graham formula, which is not a magic formula. As we discussed earlier, there are no magic formulas. It is for rough estimates only at best. I'm not a financial advisor, revisit the slides at the start of the video for disclaimers, where he gave a lot of warnings against using this as a metric of quantitative analysis. 
I'm just saying this all ahead of time so we're all clear. Inside the intelligent investor, Benjamin Graham gave a formula to estimate stock value. It was chapter 11, security analysis for the lay investor. And here it is. Value equals the trailing 12 month EPS times 8.5 plus 2G. Now that G is the expected annual growth rate for the next seven to 10 years. And as mentioned earlier in the video, you have to have a range of approximate growth values based on the bull and bear cases. So try and get two different values if you really want to use this formula to get your estimates. However, I found out this was revised to a new formula years later. And as such, I'm going to include this as well in the video. The revised version is value equals the trailing 12 month EPS times 8.5 plus 2G times 4.4 and that's all bracketed and divided by Y. Where G, once again, is the expected annual growth rate for the next seven to 10 years, and Y equals the current yield on AAA rated corporate bonds. So just some dangers with this formula. The formula could be too aggressive with high growth stocks. Applying two times the expected seven to 10 year growth rate might make the numbers higher than they should be for some really high growth stocks. And it could give a false sense of security to people if they see that big value number and then they see the current stock price and they think, wow, it's already 50% off. Not to mention, the world has changed a lot since the days that Benjamin Graham wrote this formula, even the revised version. And you'd be using past EPS data to estimate future results. On top of that, growth rates are additional estimates that could make value calculations incorrect if you don't get the correct growth rate that makes the evaluation obviously much different than if you used a smaller or higher growth rate from what it will be since you don't know the future. So never forget the margin of safety mentioned earlier in the video. And I'd hate to hear some bad news when using Benjamin Graham's formula for advice, so I wanted to add these few cautionary flags out to people just to be sure. I know you're probably excited to use this formula, but just be careful and skeptical of the number that you find using it. Now we'll get into the income sheets and the criticism of the income account, cooking their books as Benjamin Graham likes to call it. These are things that he recommends paying a special eye to in the income statement. And these days you can quickly find them with control plus F to quickly go through the company's 10K or 10Q. The first is non-recurrent profits and loss. These days it's called extraordinary charges and it has its own section. The second is operations of subsidiaries and affiliates. And third is reserves. That's just disrespectful. I put a lot of time and effort into my book. Next is deferred charges. When a company spreads out large expenses of many years instead of their singular 12 month period, moving expenses, legal fees, development expenses, and so on. Dad, I wrecked your car. It's okay though, because we can spread the loss over a seven year time span. Son, you're grounded for a seven year time span until you go to college or move out. Now we'll get into variety of depreciation policies. It goes into two categories. The first is the proper depreciation policies. And that one is the straight line, which is every depreciation asset has equal annual charges based on the estimated lifetime of the asset. The second is the overall, where there is one annual percentage to the entire depreciating assets category. And third is the sinking fund, which there are smaller deductions at start and larger ones at the end. And the second category is the improper reserve methods. And the first of which is the percent of gross taking some percent of the total gross and labeling it as depreciation. Graham feels like management often underrepresents depreciation when done this way. If you find this, Graham recommends comparing the difference between the percent depreciation listed compared to the percent of tax deductions applied. He provided an example in the book with a depreciating policy giving 8% of gross, but listed 30% in tax deductions. Five is the overall percent of gross for maintenance and depreciation together. Doing this means the more spent in maintenance, then the less is saved in a reserve for depreciation. Six is the fixed rate per product unit, and this often has similar issues to number four. For example, a company might do $1.50 in depreciation for every 100 units sold. 
And seventh is discretionary, Graham's least favorite. Management just decides what the amount should be each year. We go into the significance of earnings record. Overall, Graham feels there's too much emphasis on earnings trends. Yes, he feels they are important, but some people exclusively rely on them. Never forget to supplement your quantitative data with qualitative data. He mentions that quantitative data is only useful if supplemented by a qualitative survey of the enterprise. Look at the bigger picture first to see if the earnings are truly sustainable in the long term. Then we get into average versus trend for earnings. Wall Street places a lot of emphasis on earning trends, which makes sense. Is this sustainable or will the company face too much competition or the market stop growing so fast? Qualitatively knowing this will allow you to get in before the earnings trend continues and get a higher multiple later on. It's your job to qualitatively and quantitatively determine if the trend will continue in the future. Will you be buying a falling knife or a turnaround with company C? Qualitatively knowing will allow you to avoid it or buy it when the multiple is low, depending on how your qualitative data ends up being. Now we can get into the balance sheets and the significance of the balance sheet. It shows guidance for the amount of capital in the business, the working capital, the capitalization structure, the validity check on the income sheet, and the basis of analyzing the sources of income. Wall Street likes to ignore the balance sheet and focus on the earnings trend. Thankfully, I'm not so foolish as to do that. Benjamin Graham's opinion towards intangibles on the balance sheet. He places very little value to the intangibles. Things like goodwill, branding, and so on. Benjamin Graham prefers to see the companies through the raw numbers they display. In most of his calculations, he'll deliberately take the intangibles out completely when doing his calculations. I can't liquidate intangibles. Next is the current asset value, and Graham feels that this is more important than the book value. And his thesis for belief on this is for, one, liquidation for assets is just a rough estimate. Two, when a company sells assets and distributes to shareholders, there's often very little to gain after debt payments and the assets get distributed across all the holders. And third, stocks very frequently sell way below their liquidation value in general. True value of the assets depends on the characteristic of the asset. So things like cash will match one to one with what it says in the balance sheet. However, he thinks things like leftover inventory are only worth between 50 to 75% of what's actually listed on the balance sheet. And then we get into stock selling below liquidation value and the attractiveness that they have. Typically, these are found because the income sheet shows continually decreasing earnings. There are possibilities for satisfactory developments with these types of companies. One, they can create more earning power using the assets on hand. Two, merger with another company which can better use the current company's assets. Or three, complete liquidation. What if I just sold everything that I possibly could? Then we get into potential bargains selling below liquidation value. One, they must be selling below liquidation value where inventory gets reduced and only the tangible assets are accounted for. Two, there is little to no danger of needing to sell these assets, which basically just is looking at the debt. Three, the company formerly had larger earnings power, possibly a bad time for the industry as a whole at the time. And four, the company qualitatively looks like it can perform into the future, or be merged. If these criteria are met, Benjamin Graham considers them investment bargains. Low risk to the principal paid, high potential upside. So do you like Benjamin Graham's style? If you like his style, then try getting his books from the description below. These are the books that I read to make this video. His books will give diagrams and charts to help you learn, and his writing is very technical and great for learning. So did you enjoy the video? Did you learn something new or think about investing in a new way? Then smash the like button to show you enjoy these videos 
and subscribe and hit the bell if you're new here. These types of videos take a long time to make, so it's greatly appreciated. And thank you so much for watching.